the theme of session is the worldwide sugar and cocoa product industry now i request mr sanjay avasti to chair and lead the session and before that i would like to uh, introduce mr sanjay avasti it is my privilege to introduce the chairman of the session he is the chairman of iss city council and executive committee as well as he is a president of sugar technologist association of india new delhi mr sanjay avasti is associated with the sugar industry since last 33 years and he worked on the various key position presently he is working as a jack heavy engineering as a business head he has visited more than 85 countries including all sugar producing countries he has published 180 research paper and received many national and international prestigious awards with this i hand over to mr sanjay avasti chairman of the session thank you we are starting our first plenary session which is with the theme of the our international third international conference on sustainability challenges opportunities in global sugar industry so it matches with our uh, title worldwide sugar and co product industry as we know we are in best cycle as far as sugar and ethanol is and by product industry is concerned worldwide sugar prices are also good indian sugar prices are also good and we are having a favorable biofuel policy so we know lot about what is happening in india but here in this particular session we are having nine speakers which are going to give view of the whole world what is happening on worldwide in sugar and co product industry with this because we are running little bit late i would like to request all the speakers that we are having allotted 120 minutes and we are nine speakers and there has to be some time for question and answer so i request that every speaker should limit their talk in between 10 to 12 minutes so that we have 10 minutes time at the end for the question and answer hello one announcement is there marathi and hindi janna aikaycha bhashan he atta janna tithe machine available hai doni bajula tar please janna pahije tani tyacha lab gyava thank you so whatever speeches are here aap logo ko hindi aur marathi mein channel hai usse aap apne headphone lagakar sun sakte hain usko hindi aur marathi mein bhi with this i first of all invite madam regiana batistuta martin she is director general of philippines sugar research institute in philippines she is involved in research for a very long time and worked in corporate administration also in lantern agro industrial she is also board and trustee in sugar industry foundation and general manager and corporate administrator at bjb agro industries company in corporation with this i request madam batistra martin to come and give her presentation the second speaker madam rashmi kumari i request her to come on stage she is currently director policy planning and research at ministry of sugar industry in fiji so i request her to join us on the stage mr felix rinders he is the professional engineering and registered engineering council of south africa mr felix please join us on the stage Mr Geoff Kent is deputy director of Kane for agriculture and bioeconomy of Queensland University of Technology I request Mr Kent to join us on the stage Dr German Serino he is director of Chakra Experimental Agricola Santa Rosa Salta Argentina I request him to join us Dr 
चंद्रकांता महेंद्र नाथन शी इज सीनियर लेक्चर इन बॉटनी एंड हेड ऑफ द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बॉटनी इन ईस्टर्न यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ श्रीलंका यू वुड लाइक टू है ऑन द स्टेज बोल दिया मिस्टर विराट वैनी चरित्रत्ना एसोसिएट प्रोफेट प्रोफेसर ऑफ कैसेट स्टार्ट यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ थाईलैंड वी रिक्वेस्ट हिम टू ज्वाइन अस डॉक्टर ट्रैन थैन सोन वाइस डायरेक्टर ऑफ इंटरनेशनल सेंटर ऑफ साइंस एंड एजुकेशन एट क्यू नो बिन डिंग वियतनाम हेलो जी I request to invite and join us on the stage, Dr. Yanguri Lee, President of IPSIT and VP of SSRP and President of CSIATI, which is Sugar Cane Breeding Institute in China. So I request you all to please give a loud and grand welcome to our presenters on the stage, distinguished leaders. Organizers of VSI, professor, and distinguished guests. Good morning, everyone. Framework of the Philippine sugarcane industry. The Philippine sugarcane industry. The Philippine sugarcane industry has transformed into a multi-product industry from its traditional product, which is solely sugar. Currently, major products from sugarcane are sugar, bioethanol, and biomass power. Sustainability of the various products derived from sugarcane is dependent on volume of sugarcane production, as well as government policies and implementation of mandated programs subsidized by the government, like the block farm, socialized credit, infrastructure, human resource development and research, development and extension programs. So we have uh, 12 sugar mills, three distilleries, 13 bioethanol distilleries, and 11 operational sugar refineries, 25 operational sugar mills, and 87% of our, small, our farmers' land area is down to one or two very small, air, small, small size farms, which is not conducive to um, plantation size. That's the big problem. Agricultural landscape of the Philippine sugarcane industry has shrunk of plantation area over the years due to land conversion, agrarian reform program, and a shift to other plantations. Farm productivity is declining due to soil degradation, acidic soils, and climate change. Majority of farmers are small holders whose farm practices are not quite sustainable. Philippine raw sugar supply demand. Historically, raw sugar production is catching up with domestic. But in the past two crop years, production is declining due to plantation shrinkage and declining farm productivity. So we have here that our raw uh, from 2.5 down to 2.2, now 1.8 million metric tons. Philippine refined sugar supply demand landscape. Historically, refined sugar production is below domestic demand, which is why the Philippines has been a net importer. Although past years, uh, maybe a decade ago, we were also a net exporter. But uh, due to climate change and uh, shrinkage of production, we have uh, decreased our production productivity. Philippines is a net importer of refined sugar today, so there are no exports for the crop year 2017 and 18. I remember the professor was saying the past years before that the Philippines has always um, confident about our U.S. quota. But that is not in the case anymore, and that's the reason we are here, Professor, because um, we have been suffering of uh, declining of our productivity. 
The role of Philserine, which I am the Director General, is the sugar supply chain. Our major operation is the input supplies, breeding, which I am very um, excited to, to, to see in your area here and to learn from Professor. Breeding, micropropagation, and seed farms. Cane production, exactly what um, Brazil Representative Guy said, that our objective is sugar cane and not just sugar. We, there's more to sugar than sugar cane alone. Extension support on good agricultural practices. History has shown that the filserine varieties have composed of 61% in our country. But uh, even if these filserine varieties has increased the productivity to at least 30%, um, it has seen a slow decline, and that's the reason why I, we, together with the sugarcane industry, wish to improve our um, efficiency. Lastly, solutions to, ad to address sustainability issues of the Philippine sugarcane industry first, enhance and sustain variety improvement program. So I'm here, Professor, hopefully that we can work together, collaborate with other countries, accelerated seed production and distribution of these high-yielding varieties, address soil acidity, low organic matter content of soils cultivated to sugarcane, and last, partnership and cooperation with other sugarcane producing countries on research, development, and extension as well as sustainable agriculture practices. Way forward towards international collaboration. We have learned in Filserin after before, for many decades that the Philippines has been um, enjoying the good price of sugar and then now a decline, we have learned to do more with less. So that is our motto in Filserin how to do more with less. And so we hope to have a bilateral agreement between VSI and Filserine on varietal exchange. Also, an expand engagement with other sugarcane producing countries on social and environmental efforts for sustainable sugarcane supply chains. Collaboration with international bodies in capacitating industry technical personnel on artificial intelligence. This is so exciting but needs a lot of study. In support for sustainable sugarcane agricultural practices. Filserin plays a vital role in raising sugarcane productivity in the Philippines and I'm very happy and grateful to have been invited to this conference. Thank you very much. Madam Rashmi Kumari is currently Director of Policy, Planning and Research at Ministry of Sugar Industry in Fiji. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Honorable Shri Pawaji, uh, a distinguished uh, industry experts and uh, fellow speakers as well as the participants. Uh, good morning to you all. I'm uh, honored to present to you about the climate change situation and sugarcane production in Fiji. To pro provide you a very brief uh, overview of the sugarcane farming in Fiji, 15% of the industry, uh, people in Fiji are dependent on the industry, directly dependent on the industry for their livelihoods. We have about 35,000 hectares of uh, land under sugarcane. We produce a little less than 1.7 billion tons of uh, cane. Uh, yield is quite low at 50 tons per hectare. We have 100% is rain-fed farming. Uh, in terms of the land, we have about uh, less than 30% of the land is flat, while the rest is uh, undulated or hilly. Uh, about 10,870 farmers are actively supplying cane. We, at the moment, we have three mills. In, we used to have four mills, but three is operational at the moment and 40% uh, of the cane is being mechanically harvested. So in this graph, you can see our, our production has been declining, and one reason, uh, a major reason is climate change. 
and the black dots in the graph is actually where we had faced uh, major climate related events which I'll explain in, in next few slides. So uh, we do have other issues but climate change as mentioned is the major challenge for our sugar industry. So, uh, the major ones, uh, climate related events are uh, prolonged drought, uh, cyclones and flooding. So this has uh, impact leads to water logging of most of the farms. Uh, we as a small island developing state, we are facing salt water intrusion. Soil, soil erosion is another issue and at the moment due to all these climate related events, the soils have become saline or alkaline. So these have impact on crop loss, uh, infrastructure damages, uh, we face challenges in our ability to increase cane production. This has impact on food security uh, as well as income loss. As, and uh, finally, the affects the livelihoods of uh, people of Fiji. So just to sh provide you some stats in terms of tropical cyclones, in 1970 to 2022, we, uh, we have recorded 78 tropical cyclones. If you take recent figures like tw from 2016 to 2022, uh, we recorded 10 cyclones. Two of them were the highest of uh, magnitude of category five. So in this period, we recorded a total uh, damage and loss of 250 million Fijian. This is only for sugar industry. Um, if you see the number of cyclones, if I provide uh, statistics in terms of uh, the years, in 2016, for example, we had a category five cyclone and we recorded 30% uh, loss in production. That cyclone not only caused damages and loss to the infrastructure as well as crops, but it led to a closure, complete destroying of one of the mills, and that mill is closed for good. In 2017-18, we again have two cyclones, and we recorded a 10% damage to the crops. 2018-19, again we had three. We recorded 10% loss in uh, crops. In 2020-21, between just two months, we had two cyclones, and we recorded a loss, total loss of 20% uh, of, the, of the crops. So basically, this graph shows all the, the path of the cyclones. So looking at the, uh, at the, at the diagram, we can see we are, we as a small island nation in the Pacific have not been spared by the cyclones and it has been causing massive damage to the sugar industry. So next is salt water, sea water intrusion. We as a small island country in the Pacific have been facing salt water intrusion and the graph really the picture shows it's this, the sea water has been now in, uh, getting intrusion into the uh, land under sugarcane, mostly along the coastal areas. Uh, next is the flooding. This is again a major issue that we as a country is facing. At the moment, about 50% of our uh, land is waterlogged due to frequent rain. And this not only affects the cane production, cane yield and the cane quality of cane, but also affects our harvesting program. Uh, before last year, for instance, we faced a lot of mill stoppages due to the excessive rain. Uh, for, uh, for instance, the mill sto stoppages in 22 recorded a 150% increase uh, as well as affecting sugar milk. So the graph, this graph really shows how our, the rainfall pattern has changed in past few years. We are facing sustained and significant increase in rainfall. And this has affect, affected the soil fertility uh, through water logging, uh, leaching of nutrition, uh, nutrients, as well as uh, erosion. Then other one is the soil erosion because uh, most of our land under sugarcane is uh, hilly or undulating. 
So we are facing a lot of serious problem of soil erosion uh, due to flash flooding. So records also show that uh, we are losing 20 to 80 percent, 80 tons of soil per hectare, and uh, most of the land in in the hilly areas or undulating land is becoming unsuitable for cultivation. Then. Another issue that we are facing is drought. At the moment, we are facing the drought in Fiji, and uh, we are recording only one third of the rain that we we used to uh, achieve in past few years. So definitely, this will have impact on uh, cane production next year. Then, if we look at the economic impact of climate change. Uh, although we have we don't have empirical we have not done empirical studies but with our records we can see it has correlation Econo climate change has strong correlation with the output in terms of yield and cane production uh, in past we i mean we have recorded about loss in the field uh, in the yield 10 to 5 tons per hectare in terms of overall cane production, it's 20 to 30 uh, percent of the cane production is lost. In, if we convert that into sugar, about half to one ton of sugar is lost per hectare. And if we equate that into farmers' income, that's about $1,500 lost uh, for a farmer's income per hectare. So our strategies basically is to minimize impact of climate change on production as well as, well as the yield. The, the focus is on improving soil health and replenishment of nutrients uh, through farm rehabilitation, adoption of best farm management practices. Uh, focus is also on developing climate resilient cane varieties that can support uh, drought, flood and salt water tolerance level. And we also encourage farmers to do diversification uh, to produce other non-sugar crops as well as to uh, uh, produce livestock for their income security. So just to conclude, climate change does have a serious problem and has become a threat to our Fiji sugar industry. It has negative impact on cane production and yield and there is an income loss for both uh, farmers as well as the sugar factory. So there is a need to, to continue the implementation of climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies to minimize loss. So basically that's the end of my presentation. Um, thank you all for listening. I'll be available for any questions that you might have. Thank you. Alex is a professional engineer registered with the Engineering Council of South Africa and completed his engineering studies in 1979 from the University of Pretoria, South Africa. He is specialized in water resource management, irrigation engineering and agriculture engineering field including research design, training and mentoring. I request him to start his presentation and limit it to 10 minutes please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to be here and thank you for the invitation to address you on the topic of the scenario of the sugar industry in South Africa. As you know, we are on the southern tip of Africa and uh, I will present on the sugar industry uh, on different aspects in terms of the sugar industry as a whole, so what is coming up, uh, the sugar industry at the glance, history of sugar in South Africa, cane growing in South Africa, sugar milling and refining, then the market competitiveness, facts and figures, and then some concluding remarks. So first of all, the sugar industry in South Africa at the glance, this is where we are located, southern tip of Africa, and you will see there the two provinces, Mapumalanga and KwaZulu-Natal, where we are situated. We are doing both rain-fed as well as irrigated uh, sugarcane. The South African sugar industry is a one billion US dollar industry. It is cost competitive, 
consistently ranking in the top 15 of approximately 120 sugar producing countries worldwide. It stretched across two provinces of South Africa, namely Mapumalanga and KwaZulu Natal, and there's about 23,000 growers with 14 sugar mills. The industry produces on average 2.2 million tons of sugar per season. About 75% of the sugar on the average is marketed in the Southern African Customs Union and the remainder is exported to markets in Africa, Asia and the USA. This is the timeline of production from 2017 to the 2022-2023 uh, years and you will see it go up and down, uh, quite dependent on the rainfall that we receive because the biggest area is rain-fed sugarcane. So if one look at the average sugarcane production and yield by Africa and sub-Saharan African countries, you will see that uh, South Africa is leading with about 23% of Africa's production. Then second is way up in the north with Egypt and then the rest of the countries. If one look at the uh, sub-Saharan African countries, that is below the uh, Saharan desert, then of course South Africa is leading uh, the production. What is quite interesting and that might also interest yourself is the history of sugar in South Africa. And as we know, Sugarcane originated in Polynesia or Oceania in more than 8,000 years ago and spread from there to India. In 510 BC, the Persian King Darius described the cane as very interesting, the reach which produced honey without bees. And Europeans first came in contact with sugar in the 11th century. In 1319, it was quoted in London history book as costing two shillings a pound. Now, in today's equivalent, it will be a hundred US dollars per kilogram in present currency. Cane was taken to the West Indies by Columbus in 1493, and Portuguese settlers later planted cane on the west coast uh, of Africa. And the very first sugarcane was planted in 1848 by Edmund Morewood uh, in South Africa on the north coast of KwaZulu Natal and established a small sugar mill which he built himself with yellow wood. And the first shipment of Natal sugar to the Cape occurred in 1853. And the rise of the mining industry, as you now we discovered gold in Johannesburg and uh, the Witwatersrand, ran and that led to a labor shortage in Natal which was alleviated by sourcing indentured labor from India, the first of whom arrived in 1861 and the first 342 Indians arrived on board of the Truro from Madras followed uh, from people from Kolkata. So they assisted with the production and by 1887 there were more than seven, uh, 74 mills along the North uh, Natal coast crushing between only one and two tons of cane per day. Many of these subsequently closed and by 1900 sugar output reached 16,000 tons per annum produced by 30 mills from 2,600 hectares under cane. By 1939, annual production had reached 475,000 tons with 23 factories operating and 145,000 hectares under cane. The first bulk shipment of 5,750 tons from Durban took place in 1950. By 1975, domestic consumption of sugar had reached 1 million tons. In the 2019-2020 milling season, 2.23 million tons of sugar was produced by 14 factories from 19.2 million tons of cane. So if you look at the cane growing in South Africa, 
that is a very strategic crop for both provinces and for South Africa, and a substantial percentage of field crops uh, gross farming income uh, across these two provinces. As I've mentioned, there are about uh, 22,000 registered sugarcane growers uh, who annually produce on average 20 million tons of sugarcane with uh, 14 mills. Now the sugar milling and refining, there are 14 sugar mills upwards with about 7,000 people that are employed in those areas. The 14 sugar mills, I've just listed them there, you'll see uh, stretching from the north uh, down to the south. And of course, the market competitiveness uh, is uh, the world's most competitive producer of high quality sugar, according to independent surveys of the cost of production of more than 120 global sugar industries. The South African sugar industry consistently ranks among the top 15. And uh, you might know where the areas where the most uh, sugarcane are being produced, Brazil and India leading the way. And it's interesting if you look uh, in terms of the different uh, countries, and unfortunately this is not working. Uh, I asked them to test it before, but uh, it was uh, a a counter in terms of how it, it, it runs from 1961 and you'll see in 1996 uh, Brazil and India leading the way, South Africa is still there in the leading and then if one jump to the last couple of years you will see uh, the uh, Brazil is leading and, and this video actually goes right down to 2021 to indicate how uh, sugarcane is being produced. So if one look at the facts and figures, direct employment within the sugar industry is approximately 85,000 jobs, which represents a significant percentage of the total agricultural workforce in South Africa. And you'll see approximately 1 million people, more than 2% of South Africa's population depend on sugar industry for a living. Uh, the amount planted every year is about 350,000 hectares. Uh, with the area harvested about 270 and with a production of average of about uh, around about 20 million tons of sugar cane. In terms of the sugar production, you will see the sugar cane ratio is in a region of about 11.5%. Uh, so South African irrigation industry, you'll see plant 350,000 hectares Rain fed is 280,000 with irrigation about 70,000 hectares and we utilize sprinkler drip and center pivots uh, in the different areas, mainly the north areas are irrigated and the bottom parts are rain fed. And the water allocation from irrigation schemes, you can see it varies from 8,500 cubic meters per annum per hectare to about 13,000 in the Crocodile River in Mapumalanga to irrigate the crop with uh, only 1% uh, flat irrigation, 38% sprinkler, 23% center pivots and 37% uh, micro or drip irrigation. So in conclusion, the South African sugar industry is a cost competitive, consistently ranking in the top 15 of approximately 120 sugar producing countries worldwide. I thank you. Hand over a bouquet uh, at this uh, moment to, to Mr. Felix Render. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, and, and good morning to everyone. The Australian sugar industry started in the late 1800s um, and after expanding throughout the 20th century. Um, peaked in size a little over 36 million tonnes of sugarcane. I'm going to focus mostly on what's happened in the last 10 years or so uh, to get a sense of, sense of um, how the industry is travelling. Uh, what we've seen in that last 10 years is a drop in production of about 6% overall. 
Um, so typically now we're producing about 30 to 31 million tonnes of sugar cane. If we look at what's happening to our growing community, the number of growers has reduced. Ten years ago we had about 4,200 growers and now we have a little under 3,600 growers. So the average grower in Australia is producing about 8,200 tonnes of sugar cane. The land we have under sugar cane is something a little bit over 400,000 hectares, of which each year we harvest somewhere between 300 and 400,000. Productivity has been relatively stable through that time, um, between 80 and 100 tonnes per hectare each year. Virtually all of the sugar cane in Australia is used to produce sugar, raw sugar. And we've seen the reduction in the amount of sugar we're producing has been quite similar to what we have seen in terms of the reduction in sugar cane uh, of about 6%. Our sugar production is quite efficient and we are producing typically 140 kilograms of sugar from each tonne of sugar cane. And that's been fairly stable throughout this 10 year period. The domestic market in Australia is quite small and typically 80% of our sugar is exported each year. Uh, meaning the Australian sugar industry is, is, is highly exposed to the world sugar price. In the last 10 years, we've seen the number of sugar factories in Australia reduce from 24 down to the current 22, meaning that each of our factories is processing an average of 1.4 million tonnes of sugar cane. Compared to many other sugar industries, the Australian industry has relatively little diversification. We do have four sugar refineries, of which three are on sites of sugar mills, and we have one ethanol distillery producing um, or producing ethanol from final molasses. Cogeneration, um, we we've, have we've seen a fair bit of development in that space, up to about a capacity of 600 megawatts, from which we produce something in the order of 1,000 gigawatt hours of electricity each year, which on a per factory basis is about 27 megawatts on average, producing about 46 gigawatt hours per factory. The lack of diversification is certainly something that is of great concern to our industry. In 2022, uh, the Australian industry produced a roadmap looking, looking forward called Sugar Plus with the objective of fueling the future of food, energy and fabrication in Australia. How we will go about doing this is still something to be worked out. Areas that diversification is being looked at is in the areas of bioplastics, sustainable packaging, biofuels and precision fermentation. But there remains a lot to be done to see us moving in those directions. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Jorg Kent. Uh, I request Chairman of the session to please hand over memento to Dr. Jorg Kent. And next speaker is Dr. German 
Serino. Dr. German, the stage is yours and kindly it completed in 10 minutes. Huh? Yes, I'll try that. Well, thank you very much. I'm pleased and it's an honor to be in this impressive conference. I'd like to thank Basan Dada, the Sugar Institute, for the uh, kind invitation for me to participate and to share some of what I have to say with you, and particularly to my friend Shvajira Deshmuk, uh, advisor to the VSI. Uh, so with this, uh, my humble presentation uh, will try to give you an overview on the Argentine sugar industry for the year 2024. Uh, we basically, as uh, I, I had some help to prepare this presentation from the Argentine Sugar Center, I would like to acknowledge the help of the President Jorge Feijo for this presentation and some of the data that I'll be sharing with you. So uh, I'll also share a little bit of a history for sugarcane in Argentina. Uh, it overlaps very little with some of what was said before. Uh, so sugarcane was brought uh, into the Americas by Christopher Columbus himself. He planted the first sugarcane in La Española Island uh, by the end of the 15th century. And then the Spanish uh, distributed sugarcane in many of his colonies, and so did the Portuguese thereon, the Dutch, and others that followed. You will see in this map that the, one, that the sites that are towards the eastern coast are actually export sites, whereas the western coast, one, uh, coast uh, sites are um, only uh, catering for local uh, consumption. Argentina is not in that map, but we do have records that by uh, we celebrate our uh, sugar industry's birth in 1821 when Bishop Jose Eusebio Colombres established the first sugar mill in Tucumán and developed the industry further. And today, uh, producing nearly uh, 1,650,000 tons of sugar and nearly 550 cubic meters of ethanol, Argentina is among the top 15 sugar from sugarcane uh, producing country and among the 20 uh, largest sugar producers worldwide. We do this by growing nearly 400,000 hectares of sugarcane. With this, we generate around 23 million tons of cane per year uh, in mill land and also in some nearly 5,500 or sometimes 7,000 growers, uh, some 90% of them, particularly in Tucumán, uh, uh, with uh, exploits smaller than 100 or sometimes 50 hectares. This is ground, by, these 23 million tons of canes are ground by 19 sugar mills, uh, distilled by 16 distilleries and uh, processed in 12 ethanol dehydrating plants. Uh, additional 160 service industries work together with the mills and the industry is somewhat diversified with uh, paper manufacturing and electricity cogeneration mainly. So you will see that the main regions are Tucumán with 290,000 hectares of sugarcane and 110, 100, 110 hectares, uh, thousand hectares of uh, cane grown in Salta and Jujuy, which are the northern provinces. And this is done with uh, some care for the environment as sugarcane is grown in a region which is rich in biodiversity, which is the foothills of the southern Andes Yungas subtropical forest. So cane is grown as a monocrop. Sometimes it is rotated between cycles uh, with soya or other beans. We harvest mechanically mostly and green cane with uh, some incidental fires. Our typical yields are uh, depending on the type of farm. Larger, more uh, technified uh, farms have yields of approximately 70, 
six uh, tons of cane per hectare, whereas smaller, less technified farms uh, grow about 50 tons of cane per hectare. Average is about 65 tons of, hectare, uh, tons of cane per hectare. Uh, there is uh, about 1,200 millimeter of rain in Tucuman. There's about 800 millimeter of rain in Salta and Jujuy. And in Tucuman, the cane is more uh, susceptible to frost. This happened also in the southern tip of the Jujuy and Salta grow areas. Just to give you an idea of the divergence of the uh, industries. Uh, in uh, Tucuman, from nearly 280,000 hectares, sometimes 300, uh, they produce about 1.4 uh, million uh, tons of sugar. This is old and not taken into account ethanol. Uh, sorry, it's including the ethanol. And, uh, and in Salta and Jujuy, even if there are nearly 100,000 hectares, uh, there are about 740,000 tons of sugar produced, so the efficiency is higher, both in terms of uh, cane, tons of cane per hectare, as much as tons of sugar per tons of cane. Uh, also, you will see the huge amount of uh, growers in Tucuman. There's about 5,000 and 500 or 7,000, depends on the survey and uh, the mills occupy a lot of uh, production in the north, in Salta and Jujuy, with uh, farmers also being larger, having normally between 200 and even going up to 7,000 hectares. Uh, you see also the irrigation is more, uh, it's mandatory in the north, whereas it's only occasional in Tucuman. So cane is normally planted manually, but the large mills, they're uh, more and more adopting uh, mechanical planting. All the cultivation is done mechanically. The fertilization is done uh, normally via nitro uh, nitrogen with uh, urea or urea ammonium nitrate uh, in, the, in, in, in whole of the country. In the northern areas, there's also phosphorus fertilization and some on-demand chemical amendments for sodic saline soils. Um, so in 2006, we have our uh, biofuels law establishing a 5% ethanol content in petrol. Uh, I can see the effect of this. You can, you can see the effect of this in this little graph where you compare the sugarcane area in 2004 versus 2018, uh, when in Tucuman there was a 40% area increase in sugarcane, and this average for a total national increase of 32.5% 32 approximately. This biofuels law was substituted by a 2021 law that increased the content to 12% ethanol content in petrol. Half of it should come from sugarcane, the other half from uh, corn ethanol. So this took the ethanol production from nearly 200,000, uh, uh, sorry, 200,000 uh, cubic meters to more than 500,000 from 216 onwards. Uh, regarding grinding and exports, I'm showing you here the last five years. Please notice that 2021 and 2022 were subject to La Nina effect. I see everybody complain about excess of water during La Nina. We had a, a severe drought because of the same reason. So basically, uh, this averages to 1,650,000 ton, uh, tons of sugar, about 550,000 uh, cubic meters of ethanol. Uh, some variations there, and the exports also subject to some year-to-year -year variation, with the main destinies being USA, Chile, Uruguay, which are neighboring countries, and others. So this is socially and, econ and economically very important. It's about 60,000 direct jobs, and for this, we account the jobs by the industry itself, 
the harvesting services, very importantly, cane growers, and elaborate produce transportation, uh, adding up to a sales of about 1.3 US billion dollars. Um, so this goes 71% on the account of sugar and 29% in the account of ethanol. So uh, to give you an idea of ethanol uh, demand for biofuels, uh, our petrol consumption in 2022 was nearly 10 million metric tons of petrol. The increment versus the previous year was about 14% increase. Our petrol imports duplicated the average for the previous five years in 2022. So oil companies, they forecast a 6 to 7% annual increments, which will depend, of course, on the gas price and uh, the situation of the economy. In the six-year period from 2017 to 2022, the locally generated bioethanol, cane plus corn combined, saved petrol imports for about $3.4 million. Uh, sorry, billion dollars. <laughs> so this is uh, 1.6 on the account of sugar cane. So as a summary, uh, and this is what I gathered two weeks ago, our internal market consumes nearly, uh, a sugar internal market consumes nearly 60% of the sugarcane output. The ethanol production consumes nearly 25%. This would absorb, uh, if, if you ask more, it would absorb the excess production. And exports range in about 15%. So considering this facts that I just showed, plus the worldwide trend in the use of biofuels, which is uh, basically the increase in the cut of ethanol in the gasoline plus uh, the sustainable air fuel share of it, the sector has optimal conditions to be profitable and sustainable as it, it is being right now. However, we have a new president in Argentina. He's got a chainsaw in his campaign and the chainsaw relates to a new law uh, that is being promoted by his government, which is called Bases and Starting Points for the Liberty of the Argentinians. And this law, among many other things, it's a huge law, it derogates the sugar law from 2003 that establishes sugar import fees. The Argentine Sugar Center, Argentine sugar Center has opposed this derogation based on regulations, market regulations, subsidies, dumping, and other restrictions related to the international sugar market. And this law also uh, proposes a change in biofuels law, which uh, sustained the biofuels and considers the opportunity to continue increasing on biofuels, but uh, it opens up the possibility for importing and buying freely from any uh, provider uh, the ethanol cut. The Argentine Sugar Center opposes to this based on uh, protecting investments that were done previous to this law. So these oppositions are taking form in terms of uh, dialogues uh, to deputies and senators to reject the derogation of the sugar law and modify the changes in the biofuels law. So we'll know about the outcomes of this story in the next uh, coming months. And with this, I would like to thank you with a picture of uh, Chakra, where a variety development program. I'll talk about this in the in a presentation this afternoon, so I'd like to thank you for your attention. And now I request Chairman to hand over a memento to Dr. German Serino. Thank you. So with this, we invite her for the presentation. Good morning to everyone. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, for your valuable introduction. Um, yes, thank you. First of all, let me say a big thank to the VSI director and colleagues for giving me such a big platform. Of course, I am absolutely an academic. 
uh, yet you have recognized me as a Sri Lankan and giving me this opportunity. So I'm so humble to make my presentation in front of uh, these big delegates. Thank you so much and welcome from Sri Lanka. Well, um, I think I'm, I'm have a question whether I'm the right person to make my presentation at this forum because being Sri Lankan or oh, we Sri Lanka, mostly we are most famous to export or oh, in the expectation of a oh, wonderful, lovable tea. Of course, not the sugar. In the other word, we import sugar. So still, without sugar and tea, you can't prepare the tea. So well, though I'm a prestigious uh, tea exporter, I would like to talk something about the um, situation of tea product. Sorry, the sugar production in uh, Sri Lanka, as well as you all expected from me. So let me give a brief uh, introduction about the sugarcane production in Sri Lanka or the sugar industry in Sri Lanka. As usual everywhere, the sugarcane is the major source, sucrose extracting crop of sugar industry in Sri Lanka. Uh, it is grown mainly in the dry zone and intermediate zones. There are places which I don't want to mention here, which is so complicated, the names for you. And the per capita consumption, of course, 40 kilogram, which is, of course, a higher range in the world capita, per capita uh, level. Well, there are the rain-fed conditions and the irrigation conditions are there, mainly for the irrigation system for the sugarcane production. And uh, if you look at the history uh, of sugar production in Sri Lanka, uh, yes, it was uh, formulated in Sri Lanka as a government venture during the 1950s and later it was established of the Sri Lanka Sugarcane Corporation. So it is still under a corporation under the State Corporation Act to undertake the sugar development. So two government, mainly two mills are there, which is government owned, which is not produced as you all mentioned here in a massive scale, which is still, it is not enough to uh, meet the need of the Sri Lankans. In, uh, I will show you the statistic. If you look at here, uh, it was able to achieve 15% of the local requirement during the early 1990s, the current production means around 8% only of the requirement and the balance 92% is being taken from other countries like you all who are all here. Well, uh, some of the main problems of the sugar sector you can see here as usual. Uh, the low level productivity, of course, and the outdated machineries, which are now bit getting modified, of course. So these are the main reasons. I don't want to elaborate all the reasons because I'm sure I will not disappoint the organizers by increasing my time more than 10 minutes. Well, in 1986, the sugar industry was expanded with the establishment of two more sugar processing complexes. But in addition to this, the land was allocated among small farm holders after the establishment of these two mills. But yet, the Sri Lanka sugar sector development policy, which is called SSDP, is a strategic plan to, uh, they pr um, plan a strategic plan to increase the current cane milling capacity in the uh, well, which is going to be in 2025 as 6,550 and in 2030, which is going to be 4,500, uh, somewhere around, which is to meet the uh, local requirement or the country's requirement. Then again, if you look at the Sri Lankan map here, these are the, the which is shown in the yellow color, which is the major production part, the dry zone and the intermediate zone of Sri Lanka in sugar production. So the government policy objective in respect to sugar is to achieve at least 60% of the local requirement by the year of 2025, that is in another one year, but still approximately the 32, uh, 1,000 hectares of land would be need to be allocated for sugar development for this purpose. Uh, well, I just want to show a few statistics here without making you still more bored. So if you look at here, so the import value actually, it is 35 billions of money is being 
spent to import the required sugar for the country because only 8% per, of the production or the requirement is met by the local production. So the, this is again another present situation of this industry. So it has been a state of constant uh, construction due to the closure of the state on two mills in Hingurana. And of course, this is due to the several, particularly due to the, after the COVID, it happened to clo closure of two, some of the sub mills in Sri Lanka. Uh, again, if you look at here, some of the statistics up to 2015, the sugar production, still the fluctuation is there. Uh, some of the research is also going on with regard to the sugarcane production issues, particularly diseases and so on, all these mad things. And with regard to the SWOT analysis, if you look at um, the weaknesses and strength or the opportunity what the Sri Lanka has with regard to this, as I listed here, well, if you look at the strength of our country, so the sugar cake cultivation and sugar mills are located in rural areas as here in India as well. Therefore, the labor cost is cheap comparing to the other sugar cane producing countries. And also well established system with favorable subcultures also there. Good infrastructure facilities and highly oriented skillful work groups are there. So all this strength we have still, if you look at the weakness, so the unavailability of high yielding sugar cane variety varieties for which I am sure that the countries who are here, actually mainly the India, can of course assist us to overcome this kind of weaknesses or the issues. Then the farmers use outdated technology, then lack of uh, usage of well-developed technology and again, then lack of marketing infrastructure and also high transport cost. This is within the country I am talking about. So the, uh, if you look at the opportunities and threats, of course, the opportunities, as I mentioned earlier, the 92, mainly, one of the main opportunities is the 90% of the market share open for local sugar manufacturers, but it's the, the productions to be met to that level. Well, if you look at the threat in the country for the sugar production, because the very, very, now what we face, the current uh, threat, of course, the fluctuation of the sugar prices in the country. In worldwide, of course, we are one of the main importers. So the fluctuation in the sugar production countries who are the, the uh, highly dele the valuable delegates mentioned here, for particularly the keynote speaker as well. So you all export uh, millions and billions of tons of sugars, but we people who are ex importing the sugars, we face a problem of the price fluctuations. Say for example, now I was asking the Mr. Chairman what was the retail price of one kilogram of sugar in India. It is just around 40 rupees, he says, which is exactly double in Sri Lanka. It is in Indian money, if I say, that is 80 rupees per, ki per kilogram, which the local people really suffer to buy in the sense, it is a sudden increase right after the COVID and all these figures we are now, you all know that I should mention, we are at the economic crisis. So this kind of a sugar fluctuation, the prices, not even in sugar, but in any sector, is there badly damaging the country when we are investing a, such a billion of money for importation of sugar and other products. So again, if you look at the local market as supply of sugar in Sri Lanka comes mainly from import, the situation in the world market has a significant impact over the local price. This is what I mentioned. So let me move quickly then. Well, the future demand and the potential, the countries. Uh, current requirement is about 730,000 million tons and it is projected to increase about 765 metric tons by the year 2025. So this is in case, again, I'm telling or, or maybe even I'm appealing. So look into these fluctuations of the prices in sugar production. I do agree there are challenges in the other countries in the sugar productions, but of course there are challenges more than that for the people who are importing the sugars from various other countries. So finally, this is my references. So uh, I think uh, now I have... Uh, 
come to a conclusion after looking into all these presentations with all due respects to switch my career into academic and entrepreneur because I can simply stay in India further and I can start to export sugar to my country. It seems because I will be a billionaire than an academic. So to that extent now the price fluctuation is affecting our country. So it's my kind appeal to look into the countries who are the serious sugar importers worldwide. So that can of course motivate us for, of course we have to increase the production, there is no doubt of that. But at the same time, until we reach that level, I think the people who are, I think the major countries as the sugar exporters will be considering our situation as well to match with the price fluctuation in the market, world market of sugar. Thank you so much for this time, wonderful time, and thank you so much for your patience for listening to me. Thank you. That is the strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat for the Sri Lankan industry that we can learn something from them. And now I request Chairman to please hand over a moment to, to Dr. Chandrakanta. Thank you. The next speaker is Mr. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, firstly, I would like to thank the VSI for inviting me here so I have the opportunity to have the presentation here. So in my work here, it's just the trend or the current status of the sugar cane, sugar, and ethanol production in Thailand. I try to get all of this in around 10 minutes, so I may sweep some, some slides, maybe pass very quickly. So uh, this, is, uh, this slide is present overall uh, situation in Thailand. We have around 400,000 uh, households or around 100 uh, or around 1 million people working for the cane and sugar cane industry. And we have the planting area around 1.8 million hectare and with the 58 uh, factory. So we produce, usually we have the production of the cane around 100 million ton, just put it around figure, and we have around 10 million ton of the sugar. For the 100% of the sugar production, we have the domestic consumption around 30% and 70% for the export. And for the profit, we have the profit sharing between the farmer and the factory. It will be around 70, 30, which is general. And for the overall uh, sugar industry in Thailand, it was uh, governed by the Cane Sugar Act. Uh, 1984, so it is under the sum law to do this. For the sugar production, we also have produced the molas and then produced the ethanol to the motor industry, and we also have the sugarcane bagasse for the co-generation. The figure is the small figure is under the uh, the icon there. For the ethanol. Uh, Recently, for the past three or four years, we have the EV situation, which will, I believe, in Thailand, it may disrupt about the ethanol. So I have to think about the, this morning, data agro uh, with a very good view on the ethanol production in Brazil. <laughs> I will take that as the example. Yeah. Okay. So uh, to make it fast, I will talk about the sugar cane, sugar, and ethanol, and the EV. So to make it fast, uh, for the sugar cane, it just depends on the planting area. We have the up and down planting area of the sugar cane, and it also depends on the rainfall, which you can see it up and down, and the sugar cane production is following them. So this is simple. I think it is the same as in the India. We also have the same situation. And then uh, for the sugar cane quality, we measure the sweetness by the CCS. And for the sugar cane harvesting, we also have the fresh cut, clean cut, and the burnt cane. If you see on your right hand side, uh, the burnt cane has been reduced to allow 20 to 30 uh, percent. This is because the government has issue the law to decrease the burn cane for the past few years. We, ex uh, we expect that for the next three years, uh, we, should have we should have the burn cane less than 5%. So uh, in Thailand, we just wait and see what happens. 
And then uh, the factor affecting for the farmer, uh, certainly the first one is the price of the sugar. The price of the sugar uh, corresponds to the price that the farmer can sell the sugar cane to the factory. If uh, the sugar price is high, then they can get a high sugar cane price, and then they expand the production. If the price is low, they reduce the production. So you will see the delay of the production followed by the price of the sugar and sugar cane. Uh, another factor impact to the Thai farmer is uh, some other competitive uh, crop. Uh, recently, we have the effect mostly on the corn and the cassava, with a good price on cassava and the good price on corn. Corn have the effect after the uh, COVID-19 and after the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, and we need to produce uh, our own corn for the industry inside the country. And also for the flooding and drought that come from time to time affect the farmer's decision to continue the growing. For the sugar, the same as the sugar cane. Because the, they have more sugar cane, the factory will be very happy because they can get, produce a lot of sugar and they can get the profit. Uh, also, for, for, the, for last year, this year, sugar price is very good. So uh, the sugar factory expects a lot of sugar cane if they can get there. For the ratio between the consumption, uh, consumption domestically and egg for the export, usually we have around 25 to 30 percent of the sugar uh, consumed inside the country, and then the rest is for the export. It depends on the sugar production. If we produce more, we export more. If we produce less, we export less. Uh, the factor effect for the factory is just the sugar price that I have mentioned, and it's also with the amount of the sugar cane. If they had drought, uh, the weather not good, so we have less sugar, uh, we less sugar cane, and then we have less sugar. And then uh, the efficiency. Uh, if, we, if the factory get more profit, they can invest on the technology and then increase the efficiency. Uh, I think in Thailand and India is quite similar in this, uh, in this scenery. Then, to keep more profit for the cane sugar industry, uh, we also look for the diversification. Uh, this slide shows the general uh, diversification uh, commercially in Thailand. We have the bakas for the uh, co-generation, uh, bakas for the power and paper and the particle board industry. We have the molasses for the ethanol, and for the waste from ethanol, we also have the energy from biogas. We also have some juice directly to the ethanol, but just only maybe about 3 to 5% of the overall ethanol production. Also, ethanol in Thailand are also produced by the cassava. The cassava produced around 30% and sugar cane around 70% of the et uh, overall ethanol. Uh, this picture for the molasses, cane chui, and the cassava that I have mentioned around 70%, 30%, and the cane chui is just only 5%, a little on that one. Now it comes to the point of the ethanol production. If you see this picture, you see the slightly less production of the ethanol in Thailand. Actually, for the previous uh, plan about 10 years ago, we expect a uh, very high uh, capacity of ethanol production. But after the COVID, uh, we have the uh, slightly decrease in the uh, ethanol production. Mainly is for the EV impact for the Thailand. Thailand, after the EV come, if you can see this one. Uh, this year, we have more than 100% increase in the EV unit uh, used in Thailand. This year, for the past few years, you, have, you may have about 
10%, 50%, and then this year we have more than 100% in, uh, increase from last year for the EV vehicle. And also for the plan, it increased quite a lot. So this is the impact of the EV to the uh, ethanol in Thailand. So as I mentioned earlier, I will need to talk to Natalie about this uh, outside this presentation. So a lot of challenging the sugar pie, the policy chain, diversification, and also come with the sustainability. Uh, to, the, to do all of this, Thailand has presented the BCG model about three years ago. BCG is the bioeconomy, circular economy, and green economy. So we try to get the from agricultural product, uh, sugar cane, sugar, and go into the high value product. That is the plan for the Thailand that we want to reach there. And for the current status, we try to get the technology on the smart farm precision agriculture, uh, improve in the processing technology, going into the climate resilient crop because as the Fiji already mentioned about the climate change, uh, climate change also have the impact on Thailand also. This year, we will have less cane and quite the less uh, sugar recovery, but it is still going on the crushing season. We start around one month ago, and we will have two months uh, before we finish this crushing season. So this is all of my presentation. Before I finish, I would like to invite all of you to Thailand if you have the opportunity. We have organized the ISCT Agricultural Engineering and Economy and Extension Workshop uh, in, in Pattaya, Thailand, around uh, 19 to 23 of August. If you are interested, please send me the email and I give you more information on that. And I will send you some advertise. Uh, some, promo, uh, some PR about this letter. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Virat. To, to Dr. Virat. And next speaker is Dr. Trang Thang Sun. Thank you. Pedagogical College of Kuang Bin. So I request him to start his presentation and keep it less than 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much. So, uh, Mr. President of uh, VSI, uh, dear Professor Scientist uh, participant. Um, so now I will share uh, some information for uh, uh, for the sugar cane in Vietnam uh, with the title and overview of International Center for in Interdisciplinary Science and Education, IC and it linkages with uh, sugar sector activity in Vietnam. So uh, now some, uh, some general information um, about sugar industry in Vietnam. Um, for cultivated area, about uh, in 2022, uh, about um, more than um, 106 hectares, approximately uh, 1.6% of total, total crop uh, area. We have uh, um, 25 uh, sugar mill in operation uh, 2022, and total cross, crossing capacity more than uh, 122,000. Um, thousand TCD. So uh, in, in the season 2015-2016, we have uh, um, 41 sugar mill, and now we have only uh, 25 sugar mill in present. So we have uh, the, the big one, the biggest uh, one is Anche Sugar Mill. 
and we have the second uh, sugar mill is KCP. Uh, KCP is uh, an uh, Indian inventor. So you can see the uh, the harvest harvest can area and uh, sugar production uh, in Vietnam. Now in uh, 2022, 2023 is very low and down. And the can yield in Vietnam is lower than the can yield in the world, about 5 ton per, per hectare in uh, 2021. We have uh, some uh, problem to be uh, addressed uh, to enhance uh, sugar can and sugar pro production. The first sugar cane production area, land holding are small. Mechanization uh, of small farm is needed. Location, situation specific to sugar cane variety are urgently needed uh, to improve productivity. The percentage area of irrigated sugar cane is low. The irrigation system, water management in sugarcane is also a problem in a few areas. The sugarcane farmers are not uh, educated enough about scientific sugarcane cultivation. In small case, the following con contains the impending uh, can productivity. Uh, the first, uh, improper soil paper Preparation, low, uh, low, forty leisure investment, poor and uh, ultimately application of forty leisure, loose due to pests and disease. Post harvest management of sugar cane is uh, inadequate, uh, inadequate resulting uh, in uh, poor uh, recovery at the mill. So um, commercial canned sugar is uh, relatively low in many areas. Uh, this leads to poor sugar uh, recovery. The cost of sugar producing in Vietnam is still higher than Thailand, Philippines. It's uh, two countries in the same region uh, with our country. Can, can milling capacity of many sugar mills are uh, less than uh, 3,000 TCD. So our immediate concern is to address the following problem of the sugar industry. Low, low sugar cane productivity and sugar recovery. We need to improve uh, location-specific sugar cane variety. Need better cane management technology, crop prote protection solution, for different uh, growing area of Vietnam, uh, biocontrol umbrella, strategy to enhance sugar content in can, better port habits management technology, appropriate sugar can mechanization, sweeting our field, climate and habiting need. Periodic uh, technical training to can stop sugar technology, can grower, diversification and uh, modernization of sugar mill. So we have invited the Society of Sugar uh, Research and Promotion, India, uh, Dr. Solomon and uh, Dr. Rao, uh, Herbert and, um, and a few experts to address the issue through a conference at IC Center in Quinion, Vietnam. We are glad to announce that uh, IC uh, SSRP are holding at uh, an international sugar conference, ISC uh, 2024, from uh, 18, uh, from uh, 16 to um, 19 September 2024 at Queen Yon City in Vietnam. The theme of conference is building a resilient and sustainable global sugar 
and bioenergy industry, transforming Asian sugar sector. We hope that you uh, just your, your presence, participant, and present presentation will help uh, reviewing the sugar industry of ASEAN country and uh, Vietnam. So, so we uh, we have uh, some support from uh, and and help from uh, STIE, PSSCT, IISR, SBI, KCP Sugar Vietnam, and other supporting us in the, uh, this event. So um, I have some work uh, to introduce an uh, ICID center in Quinion City in Vietnam. In, uh, Quinion is a city in the Koto City, in the center of Vietnam. And uh, our center is uh, located in the uh, Quy Hoa Science City, the first science city in Vietnam. So our center um, is, uh, was established uh, since uh, 2013. And until now, we uh, organized and co-organized uh, more than uh, 170 international conferences. Uh, we received uh, on already uh, more than 12,000 uh, scientists, and we have uh, uh, we we received uh, already um, 18 Nobel Prize. This, and we have uh, the scientists from. Uh, from uh, 40, 40 country and territory. Our center, we have a, a beautiful landscape and uh, we, we hope that uh, you can come to the, the conference of sugarcane with uh, SSRP and, and uh, enjoy the conference, enjoy our center. Our center, uh, we have uh, uh, an international high patronage uh, scientific committee uh, to help us to, um, to build the strategy uh, and uh, build the future. It is just a beginning and we would like to hold many more sugar bio uh, energy industry related conference at IC Center. We have a state of earth art uh, conference facility at IC Center. On behalf of the conference uh, organizing, uh, organizing committee, I would like to invite you to attend ICS uh, 2024 as IC Quinion Vietnam. We are grateful for your kind, kind uh, invitation and on behalf of the president of IC, I extend my sincere thanks uh, ten to uh, VSI and organizing uh, committee of this conference for uh, your in, uh, invitation and that I can uh, to be here to share you some information. Thank you very much. Thank you. I assure you that VSI will also help to guide a few of them. Thank you. I ask chairman, uh, respected chairman, to hand over a memento to Dr. Thang San. Now, the last speaker, but not least, is Dr. Yang. Yeah. First of all, I would like to thank Vajendara Sukhoi Institute to invite me to be speaker in this important event. The topic of my presentation is so can reading in China, but first of all, I would like to introduce the state of soccer industry in China. We have two major soccer clubs, the soccer can and soccer B, but the soccer can provides about 90% of the total soccer production in China. And soccer industry is also critical for safe supply of soccer in China. And Guangxi is the biggest soccer producer. Both soccer can and soccer production occupies over 60% of the total in the country. So can production is also the main income source of farmers in this region. Our SOCP is located in the north and so can in the south. 
Uh, but our soccer production fluctuated about uh, every five to six years. In the past season, we, per, we produce uh, soccer can uh, per, uh, provide 87.9 without the soccer in China and Guangxi contributes to 6.8 percent of can soccer. Uh, from this figure, you can know that uh, in the past million season, we have very low soccer productivity because of the severe long drought occurred in Guangxi and other provinces could not compensate it. As the sugar consumption in China now uh, over 15 million tons per year, and obviously our sugar production could not meet the requirement. So we have to import about uh, 5 million tons of sugar from other countries, most from Brazil and Thailand. <coughs> and also other soccer products. The main factor is limiting soccer development in China include bad natural conditions that heal it up in areas with rain fed, poor and shallow soil, frequent climate disasters such as jaw, chilling, water locking, etc. And also two of our major varieties occupy most of the production areas. In some areas, one variety covers more than 90% of the total area. And low productivity in return crops and also short return duration. We have only one plant can and two crops, two return crops. That's because our variety is not good enough for long return production and also in appropriate feed management. So occurs frequent. And slow progress in mechanization in soccer production. The machine harvesting area is less than 30%, and machine harvest rate less than 5%, because many reasons. The small and hilly upland field, small scale farming, agricultural machinery, and economy are not compatible. So can varieties, mechanical harvesters, uploads and production and millions of cans, and also bad weather during our harvesting season. And soil acidification in many areas caused by long term over application of chemical fertilizers. Elite variety for high yield and high soccer production request good for mechanization that includes intermediate small stalks, elect and easy defoliation, high yield and high soccer, strong resistance to diseases pest, jolt, and lockdown. Strong return ability, we request more than four or more returns. We begin our soccer improvement from the elite soccer can gymnasium introduction and creation. In the past 10 years, we have introduced more than 10 or more than 100 soccer varieties from different countries. 
for selection as our potential parents. Now we have a large amount of gym blossom collections in Yunnan National Soccer Gym Blossom Repository preserves 5,717 collections of 15 species in sex journal from 34 countries and 14 domestic provinces. And in Guangxi, so can timber some repository in at present, we have more than 4,000 collections of different species and also innovative gymnasium collections. And we have evaluated a large amount of these collections. And we have got 15 strong return ability sections. 13 with a smoke resistance and 19 with a strong leaf scar resistance and 12 with a nitrogen efficient ability. And we also evaluated more than 150 sarcalum spontaneum genotypes and established a core gymnasium bank of 50 collections. We also have the hybrids of Sarkalam cultivar crossed with Elianthus alumnaceus and Spontaneum complex, Sarkalam hybrid and Nalenga perfect locum and sarcalum cultivars and sarcalum spontaneum. And we got uh, some elite progeny. And we have uh, provided a large amount of our uh, assessments for other institutions in the past 10 years. Here I show you the hybrid progeny of uh, our Sogan cultivar and ES complex. We found that the chromosome transfer mod models is N plus N. About our Sogan hybrid breeding, we pay high attention to parent combination test and good combination selection. Increase the number of combinations, limit seedings in single combination. And now we keep seeding number about 200,000 each year. Basically, we pay high attention on high sugar and high yield with resistance to disease, draw, cold, and lodging. Also, the tongue ability and leaf shedding ability, nitrogen fixation ability, and nitrogen efficient breeding. And also, we improve our regional test system. We take a correct view on the adoptability of varieties. We have made significant achievements in our hybrid breeding. We replaced the variety of F134 by GT11 in 1980s and replaced the ROG22 by GT42 GL 
GT46, GT44, etc. in Guangxi, and YZ01609 and YZ0551 in Yunnan as the dominant varieties. And we reached a group of varieties with a strong return ability and good for mechanization such as GT2944, 4955, etc. And we reached a group of high yield, high soccer varieties with strong resistance to smog such as GT5558, etc and also automatic leaf shredding variety with ripening high sugar and high yield, that is GT60. In 2022-2023 million season, GT variety occupies most areas for soap cane production in Guangxi. Uh, here I list the, the top of the various soap cane varieties in China in 2022 to 23 million season. And GT42 and GL, GL5136 is the biggest uh, dominant variety. And for the current million season. The GT varieties covered 54% of the total token producing areas in Guangxi. So and, uh, time is getting over. And here you can see the important token varieties in China at present. And now we promote the chicken supply through companies. First of all, we produce the micro propagated seedlings. That is, we call that the healthy seedling. In different seed companies. That is good for extension of elite new token varieties. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And these pathogen free healthy chicken can improve our productivity, soccer content, and return ability, and good for Planting mechanization decreased she she can application quantity and increased the, the quantity of millable cans and decreased the soccer per, and increased decreased the soccer production cost and improved the production efficiency. We also made some imp progress in, C in gene cloning and transformation. For example, we clone SLTUA gene from GT28 to form the, to obtain the cow resistant so can. And we clone the as our ICLA1 gene to develop a draw resistant variety. And we transfer from BT gene to operate insect resistant variety. And also the fused gene for resistant variety, insect resistant variety. Uh, the present focus include continue, continue introduce 
domestic influence of consumerism, selecting hybrid crossing parents, and expand the genetic diversity of parents, collect, evaluate, and utilize local wild symbolism, especially succumb spontaneum, alienated Latinasians, and Nalenga, perfect Rokema, and improved crossing technologies include flowering induction facilities, induction programs, and improved variety selection programs, including better parent combination evaluation, market location selection, evaluation of disease resistance, draw resistance, efficient nitrant use, etc. And pay more attention to gene cloning and genetic transformation, gene editing, etc. And speed up industrialization of health chicken production. And also pay higher attention to farming technologies suitable for different varieties. Cooperated closely with the different institutions for soccer variety selection and extension. Pay more attention to the related basic research. Ah, thank you for your attention. Hello, with you, Jalmo Plaza, and happy reading. I request Chairman Mr. Sanjay Avasti to hand over a moment to. To Dr. Yang Ruili, and also I am very much thankful.